That was a theory written on a paper in the middle of 2006. I handed it over to various different politicians and governments and car companies and oil companies. And by and large, oil companies would stop talking to me at that point in time. Car companies would look at me as if I was nuts. And politicians gave me the, it's great that the young generation is thinking about these problems. <laughs> Until I got to the youngest politicians, politician in the world, Shimon Peres, President of Israel. And I presented this case in a, in a closed forum, about 75 um, leaders, both the American administration and the U.S. administration. And Paris jumped in the middle of my presentation, six minutes into my presentation. By the way, I was the counterpoint. I wasn't the point. The point was Daniel Jurgen, uh, who argued he's the most formidable, um, most knowledgeable person in the world about oil, who argued that oil is cheap and abundant. It will fluctuate, but it will always come back to cheap and abundant. I came up with the oil is going to die, and we're going to replace it before we run out of it. Here's how we do it. In the middle of my presentation, President Paris said, do you have anything written about this? I gave him the white paper, expected the same great the young generation. I was surprised to find out that there was a younger politician in office at 87 years old than I was. He called me up two days later and said, come to my office. We need to talk about this paper. You really thought this one through. And within two weeks, I went across the entire government. Every single office in government pretty much feels that they own this, including the Israeli foreign office now because there have been 70 delegations to see the Israeli installations and systems that are being put in place in the last six months, more so than the Palestinian issue. <laughs> um, and lots of industrialists in Israel. And after all these meetings for two weeks, I got to the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Olmert at the time, and he told me the following thing. He said, if you think that we'll give you money to build this thing, $200 million, you're absolutely wrong. But if you find $200 million somewhere else in the world and you find a car company that's willing to build that car in volume, we'll give you a country where you can spend your money. <laughs> President Paris thought that was a very, very fair deal. <laughs> and we ended up actually going out and raising $200 million. I met with 200 different investors, potential investors, and about 10 of them put the $200 million Four, four of which put significant amounts, the other ones have put smaller amounts. There's still, I still claim that there are about 190 people in the world who think I'm absolutely nuts um, from these meetings. And we raised the capital, we met with a few car companies, and Renault actually stepped up and said, we're going to build this car and put a billion dollars into a lineup of cars in a factory for batteries. And the car is now there. We've started the installation, we've set it up in Israel. We announced two months later in Denmark, which was the second country where we were taking this to, and we announced a few months later here in Melbourne that Australia would be the third country. Two reasons why Australia. One, up until Australia, we've been always pegged as the great plan to convert islands away, small islands, away from petrol to electric. We figured out if we do Australia, nobody's ever going to claim we went small. Second reason, Australia is actually a collection of transportation islands. Very, very dense, very sprawling, very long distance. Suburb to town, which is exactly the kind of driving you want to take out. Ends up that while everybody was focusing on the small urban driver who is very green and needs to project a great brand, self-brand, we call that guy Leo DiCaprio. He's the guy who has two electric cars. One of them takes him to the private jet. <laughs> the focus actually needs to be the other 25%. It's Joe the plumber, Joe Sixpack, that drives from outside town, very, very far suburbs, into town, in traffic, every day, an hour to an hour and a half, and back. Those 25% of suburb exurb commuters account for 66% of petrol usage in any country, including Australia. Take those guys off petrol, and you've solved the problem, literally solved the problem of oil dependence for Australia. In other words, three to four million drivers here would, would solve all of Australia's oil imports. 
and it can be done in less than a decade. So we figured out, this is a great idea, let's come do it. We also figured out Australia is on the long queue, on the worst side of the queue, of car making countries. And there's a tremendous opportunity for the first countries that will come and adopt this technology, not just to be adopters, but also to become manufacturers and exporters of electric cars and batteries. Interestingly enough, what is a car battery? The best car battery today in the world is made of lithium iron and phosphate. I know a country that has lots of lithium iron phosphate, but actually exports it as lithium iron and phosphate. Instead of combining it into a powder and putting the powder on a piece of iron and collecting and cutting it in a manufacturing plant and actually exporting it as kilometers. Oil. In other words, Australia could become effectively the next Saudi Arabia of cars, electric cars. Now, it's a race. The U.S. has put $2 billion and is about to put $2 billion more into electric batteries, electric car batteries. China is not waiting behind. They're putting the same amount of money to do the same thing. Korea has already done it. Japan, which used to be the leader in lithium-ion batteries, is not waiting behind. There's a huge race. All these guys know there will be an explosion of demand. And they're ramping up to the tune of about 3 to 4 million cars a year by 2012. And that race will become faster and faster. We need to get about a billion electric car batteries between now and the middle of the next decade, 2025. Why? Because every car in the world will be electric, somewhere around 25 to 2030. And a billion car batteries will need to be made. That's the biggest industrial opportunity in the world today. Australia can pick whether to be an exporter of iron ore, phosphate, lithium, or kilometers. It's a great choice has to be made fairly quickly. Same for the car industry. It can be a great importer of Toyotas and Nissans or a great exporter of Australian Holden, not General Motor Holden. That's the choice today. By the way, when it's done, this solves the toughest emissions problem to solve. When done, just the car segment accounts, the private car segment accounts for 10% of CO2 emission, and 100%, probably 100% of ground level pollution in cities. Ground level pollution in cities accounts for more deaths per year than car accidents. Take that out, and you've saved twice as many people as car accidents kill any given year in Australia. It also is the basis for a formation of a new industry around renewable generation of electrons that will take another 10% of the emissions just by creating a collection of batteries that can store intermittent generation at any point in time. So an integrated approach saves the economy, saves the car industry, creates exports, creates jobs, and all that by creating a new brand, in a sense, for leadership for countries that will go first. We came here because we thought this would be a great place to start. We found a great CEO in Evan. We fit, we, we've now filled in the team. We're ready to roll. This is going to be a great adventure. And we hope that all of you will become evangelists and help us in getting this done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sai Agassi, from uh, the founder of Better Place. Now, Sai is lectern phobic. I'm a lecternophile. I like to stand behind the lectern and feel protected, but it also gives me, makes it easier for me to see who's asking questions. We have two roving microphones. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, Paola and uh, Giorgio have got the microphone, so if you'd like to ask a question, please stick up your hand. Uh, okay. Uh, my name's Anthony Joseph, uh, independent consultant, ex-Microsoft. Um, Ron Kogan, founder of the Green Car Journal, has said that the high price of batteries presents EVs from being an exclusive option for the future of transport. Um, the battery is separated in the better place model, uh, but still there's the price that has to be amortised. How do you address that concern? 
So, so I think a lot of people have made the mistake of looking at the battery as a component. If, if we actually did the same thing with, with gasoline cars, the most expensive component of a gasoline car today is the oil, is the gasoline. Um, accounted for 15 years worth of spending, you're buying a $20,000 device with $40,000 consumable in it. Now, unfortunately, with that consumable, if you could lock the price today, it would be $40,000. But if you really look at the projected price down the road, you're buying into $100,000 worth of petrol over the next 15 years. So we need to do a, a true assessment. Cost per kilometer, not cost to buy. Cost per kilometer, batteries are cheap compared to crude oil today. And there's an, an inherent magic in batteries and crude oil. The next barrel of oil is always more expensive. The next battery is always cheaper. So you've got two curves, two trends. And coming from the same industries I grew up in, nobody ever wants to bet against Moore's Law, right? We're already on the other side of the Moore's Law in the sense that in, it's like transistors when we figured out that they're better than a vacuum tube, they were already better. I mean, whereas with transistors, we start when they were worse. In this case, we figured it out only when they were better. We could have done this solution 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and still be better than crude oil. Now, if somebody makes the mistake of assessing batteries as components, they've made a wrong assessment. It doesn't mean that they made a right, right assumption. OK, question up the back. Um, yes, um, I'm Hans Baer, an academic at uh, Melbourne University, and I can certainly see a place for the electric car that you're talking about. But on the other hand, around the world, uh, cities are getting increasingly congested. And my fear is that the electric car might deter people from turning to mass transportation, or I might say public transportation, which we need desperately in Melbourne. So would it not be better in large cities and even medium-sized cities to focus more on developing good public transportation and think about things like the electric car for more remote communities, let's say small towns? Uh, even in cities of, let's say, 50,000, you can have uh, fairly good public transportation. Yeah, I think that's a... It's a uh... It's an admirable request to ask people to give up on their convenience, and I would love that more than anything else. It would have made my life easier if I could actually resolve things by saying, we will abolish cars and we will make everybody go through public transport. The, the issue is we're not saying don't do public transport. The only thing we're saying is if you do public transport, please do it electric as well, so that it also creates no emissions as you do it. Now, the more public transport is done by government, the more demand you will see for cars, whatever car mo model it is. Reason being, the more public transport, the more people at the edge of the decision between private and public go on public transport, and then it becomes less congested, and then more people buy cars. What we've seen time and time and time again, it's not a question of do I exercise or diet, it's the, question, it's the answer of do both. We have to do both public transport and zero emission cars in order to resolve this problem. Okay, go with the glasses just down here. Yep. Hello, um, Enlai Huiv, I'm a student. Um, Australia still produces most of its electricity using black coal, and China is starting to produce most of its electricity using brown coal. Now, I suppose an important question would be, how many watts per kilometre does this car actually do? And what does that equate to in terms of greenhouse emissions if we don't change our electricity provision strategy? So one of the great things about electricity is you have a menu of options from which to pick. The menu has price, and you can choose which one you want to pick. Better Place picked clean, renewable electricity. In other words, whenever we put 1,000 cars on the road, you'll see us put a megawatt of wind in a contract that we'll buy from suppliers like AGL, for example. Uh, the entire... Danish population will drive on 750 windmills. The Israeli population will drive on 2 megawatt of solar in the desert. When you have this opportunity to actually create another source of energy, which is conversion of photons effectively, into driving, into kilometers, then you can choose whether you want to do it in the right way or the wrong way. Now, we're not going to replace every power plant in Australia, and all we need if the entire population of Australia went to electric cars is about 8% of generation from renewable sources. So if, if I came to you and said, we will add 1% of generation every year for the next decade, you'd say, well, that's uninspiring. 
But that 1% of generation will do two things. We will buy that 1% every year at a higher price in the beginning than the cost of coal-based, marginal coal-based cost. In other words, the cost difference for us is about between one cent and two cents per kilometer. One cent being coal, two cents being renewable. That price will go down as we bring in more and more and more cars. Because, again, unlike fossil fuel, the more clean generation is done, the cheaper and cheaper and cheaper it gets. By the time we are out of the market, by the time this 8% has been done, we've created such a massive adoption that the price of the marginal generation will be cheaper than coal, even for home consumption. Um, sorry, we'll have to take the, another The rise question. in electricity is that, eight, it's that 8%. Now, here's the thing. We do something magical. We have a massive amount of batteries that are practically parked 22 hours a day. If you have an intermittent generation capacity, such as a windmill or such as a solar plant, you need a place to store no matter when the, the, the power came. And not a lot of people like to watch football in the middle of the night and have their TV go on, off, on, off, on, off based on wind, right? So what you have is a situation where if you have a lot of storage, you can take all the electricity whenever it comes. That's the beauty of adding so much power on the grid and so much storage on the grid. With that storage on the grid, we can do something else, and that is when you get to the peak hours, when air conditioners are on and everything is really, really tough, you can revert the flow and for about half an hour, an hour, use the power in the batteries to feed back into the, the grid, which is done about 20, 30 times a year for this one hour. But you don't, don't turn on the worst, most polluting um, power plants. And, and more cars come on. Every 50,000 cars that come on is one gigawatt. It's like one plant taken off the grid. Okay? The, the value for electric utilities usually love us because they take the worst plants off and they get the best electricity and they have some, somebody who's willing to take electricity whenever they got it. Okay? It's, the, it's the dream come true for, for utilities. Okay, in the middle, up in the back. My name's Derek Ryan. I'm a retired physics teacher. Uh, my question is actually very similar to... You've got to speak closer to the microphone. My, my question is very similar to the previous gentleman. Um, the, the biggest problem I see is the ability of the grid to, to handle the electric load. We've already had blackouts um, in the last couple of years here because of... Uh, line failures. And the other thing is the government at this stage is being pretty pathetic in encouraging the wind and the solar industry. And unless, um, unless something drastic can be done to improve the uptake of wind turbines and solar, uh, we, we're really going to place a heavy load on the coal-fired power stations. Right, so, so two things you have to remember. One, we, we are actually sitting on, on the grid, but we're, we're putting a lot of distributed batteries across the entire grid. When a cable falls in one place, the best thing that you can have is a bunch of electric cars parked on the other side of that cable that can actually feed emergency power to the teams that need it at that moment in time. Right? So you've got, for the first time, uninterrupted power supply sitting on the grid with a managed system, which is what we bring into the table, to, to manage who can actually give you that power and who can't, as well as who needs that power when you need it and who doesn't. We sort the entire queue of all parked cars into a queue of who needs power and who doesn't, and we shift the power back to the utilities to say how many cars can charge every three seconds. Now, the other, question, the other part of the question of the adoption, we actually take the place of government in playing the role of subsidy for the industry. Why do we do it? It's in our interest to create a zero carbon footprint sticker on the car. Uh, we, we're basically thinking that if we come to the consumer and say this is coming from coal, we'll get all the questions you're asking us now. By the way, even with coal, we're improving on carbon footprint compared to gasoline, mainly because of efficiencies of the engine. But we don't want to even get to that question. We want to create a sticker that is absolutely zero. You go in this car, you know there is this absolute zero carbon footprint to driving. And we're willing to pay the extra cent per, per kilometer because we believe it's good for the consumer to actually have one less cent of margin, but have the sense that they're driving at zero carbon footprint. Now, it may sound crazy that there's a company that comes up and says, we'd rather lose a cent, but do the right thing. But if you look at it over a broader period of time, it is much more important for us to actually generate that demand in the beginning, and then end up 10 years from now with not only us using these electrons, but actually bringing the price down and having no price fluctuation on our cost. 
So it's, it's not only a good sustainable business as far as, a, as the, the environment, it's good economics, the sustainability. Knowing predictably what the price would be regardless of the part, price of coal is a great opportunity for us to actually fix our business model for a long period of time. I drive my, I park my car on the street. I wouldn't be, I couldn't run a power lead across the, across the footpath, council wouldn't allow it. I'd have to have a special plug alongside. It's a rented place if I leave, someone doesn't need that lead. There, you can think of in uh, shopping centres, someone, uh, you run a certain number of parking spots with power leads, mm -hmm. with power points, but uh, you know, for, in an intermediate stage, someone drives with an electric car and you've got a whole lot of petrol cars taking up all the leads. There, all these little difficulties, batteries, uh, can you ask the question, please, so we okay. can get the answer? So I'm wondering what strategies you have sort of in mind for uh, solving these bits, you're, thousands of problems. You're, you're absolutely right. We, we solve a thousand small problems every three months. We, we, we reintegrated the entire solution, not just hardware and software, but tools, policies, everything else that we learn every three to four months, what we call PRISM. We're now on, on the fourth or fifth PRISM. And we find out a lot of these small questions, right? Each one of them seems small, but I'll give you one that most people won't, won't understand. Um, how many spots do you connect into the car? How many charge spots are on the car and where should they be located? It doesn't sound like something big to solve, but it ends up that if you don't have two spots and they're both in the front right and the front left, you need twice as much cost to install the network. Take it as homework. Um, the, the, the general sense is that every one of these questions is, is huge. Now, what do we find out? There are different policies. Some cities actually come up and say, you know what, we will allocate 10% of our parking spots, much like we do for handicap parking, to electric cars. We'll, park, we'll paint them blue, we'll do whatever it takes. We'll put it there so that people actually know that they have a parking spot if they want to come. We'll do it in public parking, we'll do it on street parking. If they say so, we actually come in and we install. If they don't, we say, okay, in this city, we will only take customers who have a parking garage. And remember, we can't take 100% of the drivers on day one. Eventually, what will happen, and that usually happens after about 3 or 4% adoption in the country, we go out and we install every single parking spot, every roadside park, every single parking spot will be electric. In some places, it's part of the urban planning. Vancouver announced this week that you are no longer allowed to build a single apartment, not a single building, not a single new parking lot, without every single spot being electric. Why? Because they decided to. It's policy. The, the Chinese decide policies like that. I mean, for example, they decided you can't get into any urban center, Beijing, Shanghai, um, with your gasoline car every day, with a petrol car every day. You've got to choose a day in a week, one of the five work days, in which you're not allowed to bring that car in. By 2012, it'll be three days. By 2014, it'll be disallowed. And at that point, you can pick a, an electric car or a bike. It's your choice. I mean, those are the kind of policies, and you can be very aggressive or very light. Now. We, we go through every one of these problems, the size of the battery, the fix, the, the, the motor. If you sat with us during one of our R&D meetings, you'll see that every meeting has three or four of these decisions. We go through them. We solve them. What's that? It's in Israel. <laughs>